Hi everybody, Moose Barkley here with this week's update on ADHD research. Oh, Moosey, what are you doing? Are you trying to steal my spotlight, bud? Okay, well, there you go. I don't think you could work the mouse anyway, much less the keyboard. Hi everybody, Russ Barkley back again with this week's research update for the week ending August the 11th. We've got a real mixed bag of research to talk about. Uh, I'm only going to focus on four studies. You will find all the rest of the studies published this week in the thumbnail sketch that goes along with this video. Our first article that we're going to take a look at, as you see here, was published in the journal Neural Regeneration Research. And it's a fascinating study on a possible biomarker that might eventually be used in the future, not now, but in the future, as a potential diagnostic tool for identifying people with ADHD. This is a review of the existing literature on this possible biomarker. The biomarker is called microRNA. And microRNA is expressed in whole blood serum and uh, white blood cells uh, in children and adults. The issue is whether there is some abnormalities in the expression of microRNA in people with ADHD. So the authors set out to take a look at the variety of studies that existed. And as you can see here, the reason they looked at this is that abnormal expression of microRNA has been connected to brain development and to neurological disease, and they believe could provide a novel biomarker for both diagnosis and prognosis determination in people with ADHD. Their review, which you see highlighted here, shows that recent studies that they reviewed that perform microRNA profiling in whole blood, white blood, blood plasma, blood serum in children with ADHD, they found a large number of microRNAs that were dysregulated, that is abnormal, when compared to the healthy controls that were in the study. And they go on to point out what these microRNA specific markers might be down here. We won't go into that. It's far more technical than we want to do in this research review. But they conclude by saying that there seems to be some promise of using this kind of blood diagnostic test for dysregulated microRNA segments in individuals that may be at high risk for ADHD. So uh, excellent study that I thought was very provocative and might one day offer a possible biological test for assisting us with diagnosis. So let's, let's close that out. And by the way, if you want to read these articles yourself, I've put the hot link for them in the uh, thumbnail sketch underneath each of the four articles I'm discussing today. Uh, the second paper, which is very, very different from the first paper, and which was published in Scientia, I believe that's where it was. Let me just double check. Yes, that's it. Uh, and this paper comes from, believe it or not, Uzbekistan. And it's a study of the risk of urinary disorders in children with ADHD. Uh, actually, it's the reverse of that. They start with children with urinary disorders and they look at ADHD risk among those individuals. So uh, a slight problem with the titling of the paper there, but no big deal. Uh, this study is looking at a variety of individuals who were referred to a state medical university in Uzbekistan for nighttime bedwetting, so nocturnal enuresis. And they do a variety of assessments of these children. And let's cut to the chase. After looking across all of the cases, they first of all found that the children who had urinary incontinence in the evening, especially, had much higher risks of various uh, birth and later medical complications. For instance, 29% of the kids with aneurysis had preterm birth, 39% of them had relatively low APGAR scores below the normal range. Uh, and you can see here about 11% uh, had mothers who were in labor, who were over the age of 40. Uh, and they also found other problems with the pregnancies, such as the threat that the pregnancy might 
need to be terminated in the first trimester was about 30%. All of this simply indicates that when children come into clinics with nocturnal enuresis as the principal complaint, you can expect to see a higher level of some pregnancy and birth complications and even later complications with these kinds of children. Now they did some questionnaires uh, that were completed by the parents and they noted that among those with the nocturnal enuresis, there was a much higher incidence of tearfulness, moodiness, and decreased appetite occurring in about 39% of the cases. More to our interest is that they found sleep disorders, hyperactivity, impulsivity, and attention deficits to occur in about 39% of these cases. So a very high rate of ADHD in these individuals, about five times higher than the population prevalence, the worldwide population prevalence for ADHD in children, which is about 8%. So they did find that daytime urinary incontinence did not seem to be a specific problem with these children. It was principally nighttime uh, enuresis uh, and encopresis, which is problems with control of bowel functioning were also not especially problematic in these children. Uh, they did find more complaints of anxiety, fear, and so on uh, in some of these children. So uh, what we see here then is that there is a relatively high rate of ADHD in children presenting to clinics who have nighttime enuresis. Earlier studies going back over the last oh, four or five decades found the reverse to be true as well. If you assess kids with ADHD, you do get higher rates of nocturnal enuresis and somewhat higher rates of encopresis, though that's less definitive in kids with ADHD. So it looks like the comorbidity goes both ways. One disorder predisposes to the other and vice versa. So again, I thought an interesting study, especially wanted to focus on the fact that it's a non-US research study, a lot more research on ADHD is going on outside the US uh, than ever before. And that includes, as I pointed out here, Uzbekistan. Now, the third paper I want to concentrate on here uh, is uh, another paper on the risk of internet addiction among individuals with high levels of symptoms of ADHD. This study is done with college students in Malaysia. And as with studies out of Korea, uh, out of Japan, and out of the US, I'll just cut to the chase here. This large study of about 480 students found that the higher levels of ADHD symptoms were associated with a higher risk of internet addiction. And by the way, overall, the risk of internet addiction among all of the students surveyed was 33%. Isn't that amazing? One third of university students reported having such difficulties with their internet use that it would qualify uh, as an addiction. They did a variety of statistical analyses and as I just pointed out, found that ADHD symptoms of inattention and hyperactivity were associated with internet addiction and so was ratings of loneliness as well. Kind of replicates what we've seen in the earlier studies on internet addiction in that in addition to ADHD, problems with social functioning uh, and even problems with anxiety and depression are all linked to risk of internet addiction. So uh, I thought, again, another interesting study It just adds to the others I've discussed in earlier videos from earlier research reviews uh, that internet addiction does appear to be problematic among those not only with high symptoms of ADHD, but in other studies, people who went on to have full diagnostic criteria for the disorder. Now, our final paper uh, is gonna be one on neuroimaging. And this is a fascinating paper uh, that uh, is a study of functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI. So it's not just looking at brain structure, but it's looking at how those structures are functioning. How active are they? How interconnected are they? Uh, and they are going to compare uh, samples of autistic individuals, 19 ADHD individuals, 
and 15 neurotypical adults. By the way, that's not uncommon in neuroimaging research to use small samples because this is very difficult information to collect uh, and analyze uh, in individuals, particularly when we're talking about uh, individuals who might be uh, in foreign countries where this technology is not quite so readily available. So this was published in the journal Brain Connectivity. Uh, and the results, as you see here, are that the analysis showed that the cerebellar vermis, the precuneus, and the right cerebellum, region 4, were associated more with autism in these adults when compared to the neurotypical sample. So uh, I'll show you these areas in a moment. In those with ADHD, it was found that the cerebellar vermis again, the right inferior frontal gyrus, not surprisingly, the frontal lobe has been associated with ADHD previously, particularly more the right hemisphere than the left, and then the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex was associated more with autism when compared with uh, individuals with ADHD. So just another study that's pointing out several brain regions that are not developing and functioning properly, their connectivity appears to be disrupted, and that some of these regions are shared between autism and ADHD, specifically the cerebellar vermis and certain sections of the prefrontal cortex seem to be associated with both disorders, but the precuneus seems to be linked more with autism. So uh, let me just show you uh, a graph here to illustrate this or a figure that is. Uh, this is a diagram of the brain with the right hemisphere uh, removed, the right posterior hemisphere. And what we're talking about here, the cerebellar vermis is this central area in the cerebellum. Uh, and it has been linked to both ADHD and autism. And as this study found, uh, other sections of the cerebellum were also linked with autism. The other area linked with autism is the precuneus, which is a highly developed area of the parietal lobe, which you sort of see here, that's part of the parietal lobe association area. And it has been associated with uh, the ability to orient attention, to focus attention, uh, and this too was disrupted in individuals with uh, autism. And then finally, the inferior frontal gyrus, which is up here, was linked more with ADHD, and this dorsolateral cortex here, that's the outside surface of the frontal lobe, particularly on the right, was linked more with autism than even with ADHD. So uh, yet again, more evidence of specific brain regions linked to ADHD, and in this case, showing disrupted functioning and connectivity in both of these disorders. But there are differences between the disorders in which brain regions are impaired, though they do seem to share some involvement of the cerebellar vermis back here. So there you have it, folks. That's our research review for this week. Please have a look at the thumbnail sketch for all the rest of the research that was published. If you enjoy this information uh, on this channel, please subscribe or recommend it to others. Uh, and also, uh, thanks for sending in replies about Moose, my dog. Uh, Moosey likes to show up on camera, especially when he gets bacon, as he did this evening. So I hope you enjoyed that little bit of uh, humor. Thanks again. Be well. Bye now.